begin by reading verse number 9. Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. And now notice Paul continues to result, rejoice, present tense. And not that it made them sorry. Now they had sin in their camp. As you know, the first Corinthians letter was very clear. This man that committed incest with his father's wife, uh, was uh, re they were rejoicing in this instead of disciplining him. So they were sorry. They were angry at Paul, actually. But he says that he soared to repentance. He made sorry after a godly manner. That word repentance, metanoia. And meta is a change. Noia from noose to mind, a change of mind. That's what's needed before a person can be saved, before a person can be a genuine Christian. They must change their mind at least about two things. Number one, change their mind about that they're sinners. Many people in this world, they don't think they're sinners. They're not just as good as anybody else. I want to go to heaven. I do good works. I come to church. I give some money. Or I do this, or I do that. They've got to change their mind about that. God calls every one of us sinners, lost bound for hell. We must change our mind concerning sin. The second thing people have to change their mind about is the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. Died for the sins of the whole world on the cross of Calvary. And people say, well, I don't believe that. He just died. He was a martyr. Something else. No. If you don't change your mind about why Christ died, you're lost. He died for your sins, for my sins. Change the mind. That's repentance. And the third thing you must then accept and receive and trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Those three items are in necessary. But Paul says, uh, I didn't make you sorry, but you soared to repentance. <clears throat> you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us and nothing. They backed down finally. They finally changed their mind. And they said, all right, we shouldn't have this man, this godless man, our church will kick him out till he repents and changes his mind and changes his attitude, which he did. And then they brought him back. The first verse is on repentance, a number of verses. In Mark 2, verse 17, uh, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If a person thinks he or she is whole and well, who needs a physician? Well, some physicians are not very good anyway, but who needs a physician? You, that's why repentance is necessary. You have to realize you're sick, you're a sinner, you're lost, you're bound for hell. Repentance is needful. In Luke 3, in verse 8, John the Baptist said, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. They say, well, repented, change their mind, but the fruits are not there. It's their phony <coughs> repentances. There are a lot of phony repentances as well. And then uh, Luke 24, verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance and remission of sins preached. In Acts 5 and verse 31, him hath God exalted with his right hand, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. They had to change their mind regarding their Messiah and realize that it's he and trust in him as their savior and redeemer. Very important. In Acts 11, verse 18, uh, when they heard these things, they held their peace, glorified God, saying, Thou, then God hath also, uh, God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. The Jews at first didn't think that the Gentiles should have anything to do with the, the message, but God did grant to the Gentiles, some of the Gentiles <coughs> accepted him, repentance unto life. In Acts 20, verse 21, <coughs> Testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. Change our mind regarding God and faith in our Savior. Then in 2 Timothy 2, in verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. Uh, a lot of times we don't agree with truth. We don't want to accept the truth. But God says, I want to give them a change of mind, a repentance, and acknowledging truth. The scriptures are true, but people don't believe the scriptures, many of them, and they don't understand what is there. Then in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, we know this one. Let's say it together. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, 
that some man count slightness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the Now this is contrary to the hyper Calvinist heresy. The hyper Calvinist heresy says God does not want all people to come to repentance and change their mind regarding Christ and come to salvation. They say that's foolishness, it's folly. Where did you get that in the Bible? We got it right here in this verse, very simple. They say God only wants the elect, a certain little group that he picked out a long time ago to be saved. The rest of us, lost. Christ didn't die for you. He didn't do anything for you. You can't be saved. That's the foolishness, the heresy of the hyper Calvinist message. And that's going in Presbyterian churches and various other churches all over the world. It's growing and growing and growing. Uh, at Dallas Theological Seminary, my school, uh, we used to have a four-point Calvinist position, not a five-point. Dr. Schaefer never believed that beginning L, the limited atonement. <coughs> he was always for unlimited atonement. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. But uh, now, I think Dallas has got some people in there that believe in the whole five points. And so every one of these seminaries is teaching this fallacious doctrine that Christ just died for a certain group. No, he died. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. He's not willing, but he's not going to force people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith either. He's not willing. doesn't mean that everybody's going to be saved. Everybody's going to be, come to repentance and change their mind and be a Christian. But he's not willing. It's up to us. God made the first move when he sent his son from heaven to this earth. And he made the second move when the son died for the sins of the world on the cross of Calvary. Now it is your move and my move to accept this Savior as our own and be saved, become a Christian. Let's read verse number 10 together. For godly sorrow worketh sentence to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Sorrow is mentioned here. All of us have some type of sorrow or another, uh, physical sorrow, spiritual sorrow, various different types, but it says godly sorrow. There's a, there's a godly sorrow that God helps us with, and the, there's eight results of this godly sorrow. We have it in this paper that we gave you. The first result is sentence to salvation. Sorrow, many times, when people are sorrowful, they can come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It works many times through salvation, trusting in the Lord. They're weak, they're sick, and they want to trust someone that's strong. The Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior. Not to be repented of, uh, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Just the worldly type of sorrow, not a godly sorrow, just a sorrow because of the things of this world. Death comes. As far as sorrow, and there are various scriptures that have to do with that. For instance, in John 16, and verse 6, the Lord Jesus told his disciples, Because I have said these things unto you, he told him he's going to leave. He told him he's going to be crucified. Because he'll be on the cross of Calvary. Then raised at three days and three nights. Because I told these things, sorrow hath filled your heart. They were sorry. They were sorry. And then in John 16, verse 20, the Lord Jesus again told his apostles, Verily I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, because he is crucified on the cross. These apostles did weep and lament. But the world shall rejoice. This wicked world is so glad that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. The world of that day and the world of today, they don't care about Christ. They just say, wonderful, get him out of here. As the Jews urged the, the, the Romans to crucify him, the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, your apostles. But the Lord Jesus told his apostles, your sorrow shall be turned into joy. When he's raised from the dead, bodily raised, and they see the Lord and meet him, and his, your sorrow shall be turned into joy. It's a great promise that he told them before he died. In 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 7, Contrarywise, you ought rather to forgive him, talking about a person, this incestuous man, and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Now, he committed a great sin. Kick him out of your church, yes, but comfort him, lest he be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. And then get him back into your church once he repents and changes his mind concerning his sin. And they did this, and he changed his mind, and he brought him back. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, 
Paul said to the church of Thessalonica, But I would not that you should be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is, those who have died, those Christian believers that have died. Don't be ignorant concerning that, that ye sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. Now there's a sorrow that's Christian sorrow, a godly sorrow, when our loved one who's a Christian, a genuine Christian dies, has a godly sorrow. We miss them. We'd rather like to see them. My wife's dad and mom, we saw it after their death. Her sister, both sisters, we saw it after that. But it's a different situation when they're saved. Godly sorrow is different, not as ones that have no hope. I heard the people, the people around the 9-11, reading off the names of those that died this morning. And uh, several of them said, uh, oh, my father, he's with us. And so on. He's not with us unless he's a genuine Christian. And they said, oh, we're going to go see him. Said, well, if, you're, if he's in hell, you're going to see him in hell. If you're in it, not a Christian, they have the theological things all mixed up, these people that have lost their, their loved ones. Because the, the error and heresy of the world is that everybody is saved. Everybody's going to heaven. Heresy after heresy after heresy. Uh, universalism is unscriptural. Everybody is not going to heaven. If you want to have a heaven that everybody goes to, make up your own. If you're talking about the Bible's heaven, only those that are genuinely born again, saved Christians that have accepted Christ as their Savior are going to go there. Those that reject our Savior are going to go to the Bible's lake of fire, hell for every eternity. And so these people got all mixed up. I know they're missing their friends, their, their loved ones, their father, their husband, whoever it may be, and they're talking about this, and they name them. Well, almost 3,000 dead on that terrible occasion. It's a sad situation, sad situation. There are many of the policemen and various other ones who went in to clean up the mess because of the atomic radiation and various other things. They're not dead. A lot of hundreds of those people died as well. Uh, they were not told in advance that this was polluted stuff. They went in there. It's a sad thing. But the sorrow of the world is not the same sorrow that believer Christians have when their loved one, who is a genuine Christian, dies and goes to heaven. Let's read verse number 11 together. <clears throat> For behold, this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sorrow, what carefulness it wrought to you, and what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge in all things have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. On the paper, the results of godly sorrow, uh, salvation, that first result is very clear. That carefulness, that's an earnestness and diligence. Godly sorrow brings earnestly and, and diligence in the service of the Lord. Even though there's sorrow, you can still serve the Lord in your sorrow. Clearing yourself, that's a verbal defense and a reason type of a statement. You can understand why you're there and what the situation is like. Uh, the indignation, the irritation. Yes, sorrow brings irritation. It brings uh, that indignation. Uh, the fear, possibly referring to the fear of the Lord. Very important that we fear the Lord and and serve him even in our sorrow, whatever the sorrow might be. Vehement desire, longing uh, for the Lord again. Uh, vehement desire for the Lord, zeal, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, not giving up because there's sorrow. Revenge against maybe being falsely accused. Some of these things are, are clear. But some of the verses of scripture on carefulness, for example, in Ezekiel 12, verse 18. Son of man, eat thy bread with quaking and drink thy water with trembling and with carefulness. Carefulness. Now uh, they shall eat their bread with carefulness and drink their water with astonishment. So sometimes carefulness and earnestness is a difficult situation. The clearing of themselves, the defense or argument, indignation. Some of the scriptures on indignation in Isaiah 66 and verse 14. Uh, you see your heart shall rejoice, your bones shall flourish like a herb. The hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants and his indignation toward his enemies. Now, God has indignation toward his enemies, and sorrow can have indignation, uh, also can bring earnestness and diligence in that sense. And then at Jeremiah 15, verse 17, this word is used. Uh, Jeremiah says, I sat not in the assembly 
of the mockers. A lot of people in Jeremiah's day were mocking against the Lord, against all the problems that they had. And he says, I sat alone. And many of us who stand for the word of God, like Jeremiah, stand and sit alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. Indignation against the sin of the wickedness of the people that were carrying on. And Jeremiah was trying to be a faithful prophet. In Nahum chapter 1 and verse 6, who can stand before his indignation? Another verse on that. And as far as the fear, the godly sore bringing fear, the fear of the Lord is mentioned in many places. In Psalm 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, in other words, respect him and flee to him. Uh, then in Proverbs 8 and verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. And then Proverbs 14, verse 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. The fear of the Lord, trusting him and respecting him. In Proverbs 16, and verse 6, by mercy and truth iniquity is purged, but by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. To get away from evil if they're trusting in the Lord and fearing the Lord. And then the, this vehement desire, longing for the Lord, vehement desire. In Jonah 4, and verse 8, uh, it came to pass on the Sunday to rise that God prepared a vehement east wind, a vehement, very strong east wind. The sun beat upon the head of Jonah, but he fainted. And then in 2 Chronicles 15, verse 15, uh, all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had been had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. Fortunately, there were some that did seek the Lord with their whole desire. And he was found of them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. That whole desire, that vehement desire, was used of these Christian, these the Jews, rather, that sought the Lord in Second Chronicles. Then Second Chronicles 7, and verse 7, uh, not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me. So in 2 Corinthians, Paul said, the Corinthians had their earnest desire toward the Lord, your mourning. And then in Philippians 1 and verse 23, uh, Paul in jail, a Roman dungeon, when he wrote the book of Philippians, he said, I am in a strait, a tight place, but tricks two things. We know this one, let's say this one having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Desire, strong desire to be with Christ. He'd been with Christ. He knew where Christ was. Uh, he was stoned in Acts chapter 14 and at Lystra, and I think he was taken to heaven. For a time he saw all the glories of heaven. He knew what the Lord Jesus was like, and he has a strong desire to be with Christ, which is far better. And he knew it was far better. The Lord said, no, Paul, you're not finished yet. He brought him right back to this earth, revived him. He got up and started preaching the Lord. But he knew that heaven was far better than this earth. Interesting. Strong desire. In the first Peter 2, in verse 2, we know this one. Let's say that one. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow in her life. Strong desire. Being as a sorrow is the results in godly desire to, to seek the word of the Lord to grow thereby. The well, seventh thing, zeal, uh, it's used 16 times in Scripture, but some of the verses in Isaiah 9 and verse 7, strong desire, fervent in our spirit. Uh, the increase of his government and peace, there should be no end. On the throne of, the, of David, upon the kingdom, in order to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. Then the next part of that verse, Isaiah 9, 7, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. The Lord Jesus rules and reigns in the millennial reign of Christ in Jerusalem. All these things that take care of will be take place, and God's zeal will perform this. Then in Romans 10 and verse 2, it talks about Israel. The sad thing, some people are just like this, some alleged Christians, some professing Christians are the same way. I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Strong desire, but no knowledge, don't know how to do it. And it's like a man that tries to build a 10-story skyscraper. He may want to build it. It's a great des desire and a zeal to do it. Doesn't know the first thing what to do next. <laughs> uh, 
zeal, no knowledge. And if we're, for the Lord Jesus Christ, genuine Christians, we've got to have both things. We have to have a knowledge of the Scriptures, the Word of God, to know what it's all about, and we have a zeal to profess and proclaim that knowledge and that Savior that, who saved us. Then uh, in Philippians 3, verse 6, Paul talks about his own zeal. Turning zeal, he had plenty of it. Persecuting the church. Persecuting the church. That was how zealous he was in the Jewish religion, the fair, being a Pharisee. Persecuted, wanted to kill the Christians and imprison them. And then revenge. Uh, in Jeremiah 15, verse 15, O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me. Revenge me of my persecutors. Revenge me of my persecutors. And that's a type of revenge. Sometimes sorrow brings a desire for revenge against those that persecute us as well. In 2 Corinthians 10, and verse 6, having a readiness of mind to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Revenging disobedience. But God is the one that avenges and revenges. We can't revenge people. He's the one that to make it right, if he's going to make it right. And he says about clearing. <laughs> he says, in all things you've proved yourself to be clear in this matter. A lot of people are not clear in the matters of Scripture. Many things are not, not crystal clear. But uh, they've got to be clear on the things of the Lord and the, the reason for God's judgment, the reason for sorrow, so God brings sorrow into our hearts and into our lives, to our families, into our church. We've got to understand it, and we've got to be clear as far as understanding as to the reasons for this. In Psalm 51, verse 4, David said, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. David murdered Uriah the Hittite, caused him to be murdered. He committed adultery with Uriah's wife. He finally came to himself and repented of these two grave, grave, serious sins. And in Psalm 51, 4, he said, Against thee, talking to the Lord, thee only have I sinned, done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. And God is always clear, and he made David understand his judgments. And God did judge David because of his sins, but David finally got, gave to himself and repented about the thing and understood the gravity. Let's read verse number 12 together. <clears throat> Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. He wrote, he tells why he wrote this letter, 1 Corinthians letter. It was not for the cause of him that did the wrong. Now, if the man that committed incest with his father's wife, that was a very serious sin. But that's not why he wrote nor did he write for the cause of the ones that suffered wrong. Uh, the wife of this man suffered wrong. The church suffered wrong. But that's not why he wrote 1 Corinthians. He says very clearly, he wrote that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Well, they probably thought, well, he cares for us? He wrote such a hot letter. He accused us of so many things. He made many of us angry. He wants us to understand his care. Well, Paul did have a care for them. He had a care for all of the people, all the churches that he ministered to. And we've got a care for fellow believers. The pastor's got a care for this church, the people that are there in the church. And we've got a care for believers, genuine Christians, care for other people. In Luke 10, and verse 34, it's an example of caring. There's a man that was caught among the thieves. You remember the man that was bound and with wounds and the Levite came along and passed by on the other side and the other priest came along and then a Samaritan came along and he went to this man that was caught up by robbers and beaten and left half dead he went to him in Luke 10 34 bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine which was an antiseptic set him on his own beast didn't even make him walk back the city and brought him to an inn, an inn, to take care and took care of him. Uh, this, this, this uh, good Samaritan 
took care of this man that was beaten and left for dead. And we've got to care for our fellow believers as well. Not necessarily physical, only physical. We care for them if they're physically in need, but we care for them in spiritual needs as well. There's different kinds of needs. There's spiritual needs and there's physical needs. Both are very important. I'm sure this man that had been beaten almost to death <coughs> had both kinds of needs, spiritual and physical. And this Samaritan took care of least of the physical side of him and brought him to the end and took care of him. And so whatever he spends, put that in my account, I'll pay you when I come back. This Samaritan, a half-breed, half Greek and half Jew, half Gentile, half Jew, and yet he is the one that cared for this man that was beaten up half to death. Priest didn't care, it was a Jew. Levi didn't care, it was a Jew. But the Samaritan, half and half, half breed, took care. And then in Luke 10, 35, <coughs> the same man, the same Samaritan, and on the morrow when he departed, when the Samaritan departed from the inn, he took out two pence and gave them to the host, the one in charge of the inn, and said unto him, Take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Take care of him right up to the end. Whatever he needs, I'll take care of him. That's caring. You've got to care completely for people, spirit, soul, and body as well. Then in 1 Corinthians 12, in verse 25, <coughs> Paul talks about the divisions that they had in the Corinthian church, the schisms, the different scrapes that one different had against one another, uh, that there should be no schism in the body. He says, I don't want a division in schism that the members should have the same care one for another. Those that are members of the body of Christ in that church of Corinth, the same care one for another. And so in our church, we should care one for another and have some care and the same care. And then in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 16, <clears throat> thanks be to God which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. Titus, pastor of the church at Crete, was sent to Corinthians in the second Corinthians 8 16 Paul says Titus cared for you and he had a good care and godly care for the Corinthian Christians and also in second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 28 <clears throat> Paul talked about all the things that came to him all the difficulties all the beatings and all the different things the shipwrecks they added the final thing that was a the trouble to him. He said, beside those things, all the things that he listed, terrible things, that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Those are cares from within. The Christian believers, cares within. He had to care for the church at Ephesus, church at Colossae, church at Philippi, at Philemon, all these different churches, or even at Thessalonica all the churches and the care of the churches. And that was not easy. <clears throat> As you know, people in churches are not always happy campers. They're not always happy campers. Some of them are very seriously sick, sorrowful, grumpy, complaining, and various other things. <laughs> so Paul says, I've got a lot of care for these churches. And Corinthians are one of the, certainly the Church of Corinth is one of the most uh, complaining churches of, of all of them. If you read that, those 15 chapters in Corinthians, the care of the church. That's in addition to the beatings and shipwrecks and all the other things. Then Philippians 2 and verse 20. He talks about uh, Philemon. Talk to Philemon. He says, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. This man that would care to help this man who was fleeing from his owner, uh, Onesimus, fleeing from the owner, and a man who came along and would care for this runaway slave. And then in 1 Peter 5, 7, we know this one, let's say this one together. <coughs> Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. All our care. There are two senses of the word care. And this casting your care, that means your worry, all your concerns. For he careth for you. He's concerned for you. So it's a different sense of caring. 
<clears throat> casting your care, your concern, <clears throat> all the difficulties, the problems. The Lord Jesus cares and wants to comfort you and look after you. That's the second sense of the verb to care. <clears throat> Let's read verse number 13 together. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedeth the more joy me for the joy of Titus, because his spirit is refreshed by you all. Paul says, we were comforted when you're comforted. When the Corinthians got this second letter, they were comforted in it. They were upset in the first letter, but they were comforted here, and because they were comforted, that comforted his heart, the one that wrote the letter. It says, I was comforted. And then exceedingly the more we joyed, there was joy in addition to comfort, for the joy of Titus. Titus apparently reported back to Paul. Titus, the pastor of the church at Crete, he reported back to Paul what he saw at Corinth and how they were comforted in various details. And then it says, we were joyful because of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by you all. The Christians at Corinth refreshed the spirit of Titus, who was there. In the first letter of Corinthians, the church was a mess. But when they finished up and they repented, they got the joy of the Lord, they were so, re so joyful, they could refresh the, the spirit of Titus. And he was a joyful, Paul was very happy, exceedingly joyful, because Titus was very happy at his being refreshed by you all. Are you able to refresh one another? I hope that you can. I hope there's some ability in you, or if you're really a genuine Christian, there should be an ability to refresh. But in order to refresh others, you must be refreshed yourself. You can't give what you don't have. It's impossible. If you're gloomy, you reflect the gloom. If you're refreshing, you maybe you can refresh others. Who knows? As far as comfort, there's a number of verses on comfort, but in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, perhaps we know this one, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we might be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Four times comfort in verse number 4. And if we have comfort, we can comfort others important. In 2 Corinthians 7 verse 6 Nevertheless God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Titus the pastor of the church of Crete comforted Paul and he was comforted. What I said before to refresh others you need refreshment yourself. To comfort others you need comfort yourself. It's just like if you have need of food you can't give food to anybody else. But if you got some food, you can share it. You've got to have it yourself, and then you can share it. This is very important. Comfort. Uh, and then in 1 Thessalonians 2, and verse 11, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children. We had four sons and a daughter. We tried when we needed to to comfort these children. Whatever their needs were, we tried to comfort. He says, Paul, says, I comforted you in Thessalonica, you church people there, and charged you, exhorted you, just like a father does his children. But sometimes the children don't like our exhortations. They don't like them. Sometimes we have to be very strong with our children. And many times we can be a comfort and a joy unto them as well. Paul was that way as well. Then there's verses on, on joy. For instance, in Galatians 5.22, <coughs> One of the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long-suffering, peace, long-suffering. All these different, nine different fruits of the Spirit. The second one is joy. If we've been controlled by God the Holy Spirit who indwells every genuine Christian, we have the fruit of joy within us. God's joy. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6, Paul says, He became followers of us, you people in the church of Thessalonica, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. They had a lot of trouble with the church of Thessalonica. They received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Joy of the Holy Spirit even in the midst of affliction. 
uh, affliction doesn't have to hurt us and drop us down. We can be joyful with the power of the God, the Holy Spirit, in drawing us and leading us. In 1 Peter 1, in verse 8, <coughs> we know this one, talking about the Lord Jesus, whom having not seen, he loved, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, he rejoiced with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable, whom having not seen, he loved, the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John 1, in verse 4, one of the purposes that Paul, that John wrote to the people he wrote to is that these things I write unto you, that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. The joy of the Lord. In 3 John, verse 4, <coughs> by the way, our book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is, is now in the printer's hands. should be ready in several weeks. We'll be able to have it over 300 pages in those three books, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. That's a, a great joy for any preacher, pastor, friend, to have one's elites of Christ, one's he's ministering to, to walk in truth, the truth of the scripture. It's one thing to have the truth, it's another thing to walk in the truth, to follow the truth, to abide in the truth. Titus, in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 23, whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner, fellow helper concerning you. Titus was a great friend of Paul, and he's quoted many times by Paul. Let's read verse number 14 together. For if I have boasted any time of him to you, I am not ashamed, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found the truth. Now notice Paul talks about a little bit of boasting. Uh, complimenting. He says, if I have boasted anything to him, that is to Titus, of you, about you as a church. If I said anything about you at Corinthians, at Corinth, about you as a church, I'm not ashamed. Uh, some of the things were good, and Paul told Titus about these good things. But, as we speak all things to you in truth, he didn't lie. A lot of people just build up things and lie through their teeth and add to and take away from and just boast and boast and put on all kinds of untruth. Paul says, I didn't do that. Anything I told Titus about you at Corinth was the truth. I told only the truth. <laughs> Even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, the boasting of the, the Corinth, I meant concerning Corinth, I took that, is also found the truth. He didn't lie when he told Titus about the church at Corinth. He told the facts, told the truth, and that's what we should do as well. Sometimes it's better not to say anything if we have to lie about things. Just don't just shut up. Don't even talk about it. <clears throat> if the truth hurts, sometimes just don't say anything. But if, it, if people need the truth, we speak the truth, speaking the truth in love, of course, as the scripture tells us. Uh, but notice he says, I'm not ashamed to speak about people at Corinth in truth. Various verses on not being ashamed. In Psalm 119, number 80, let my heart be sound in thy statutes, the statutes of the Lord, that I be not ashamed. We have to be sound in the statutes, not simply know them a little bit, but sound. Not to be ashamed of the Lord. Romans 1 16, we know that one, let's say it one. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is left off in all the modern versions because the Gnostic critical Greek text omits good news about Christ. They don't like Christ. He's just a man. He's a sinner. He needed to be saved. He didn't die on the cross. Some heathen person did instead. So take away Christ. And all these people, these new versions, they say, oh, what a wonderful version this is. What a wonderful NIV, English Standard Version, Revised Standard Version, uh, all these things. Uh, <coughs> American Standard Version. Well, they don't have to say anything about the Gospel of Christ in any of this version. It's the Gospel, and that's it. Not ashamed. Paul was not ashamed. Power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, only to those that believe, is God's power to salvation. That's 2 Timothy 1.16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, they ought to refresh me, and was not ashamed of my chain. Second Timothy was written in Paul's second Roman imprisonment. 
And when he was in prison, many people were ashamed of Paul's chain, not of Nesiphorus. He went and visited Paul faithfully. Now, Paul died in that second Roman imprisonment. Head was cut off by the Machaira, the short sword 18 inches long, chopped off according to tradition. But the Nesimus visited him. He was not ashamed of my chain. And if some of the rest of us get into prison wrongfully, whether it's FEMA camp or anything else, I hope others that are able to come will not be ashamed of the imprisonment that we have as well. <clears throat> Those that are sick in the hospitals and bound by needles and various other things, I hope when we visit we're not ashamed that they're in the hospital. We should not be ashamed. We should visit our people in that way. <clears throat> Hebrews 2, verse 11. He that sanctifieth, they that are sanctified are of one, which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Paul writes to the Christians there in the book of Hebrews, and he says, if they're brethren, Lord Jesus is not ashamed, that God the Father is not ashamed to call those who are genuine Christians brethren. If we're not deity, but if we're genuine Christians, we're brethren, we're sisters in the Lord, and that's important. Not ashamed to call us brethren. Let's read verse number 15 together. <clears throat> and his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, with fear and trembling you received him. The inward affection, talking about Titus again, and he says, whilst he remembered the obedience of you, they were obedient. They got rid of that incestuous man, they kicked him out of the church temporarily at least. So he got back into fellowship with the Lord. With fear and trembling, he received him. <clears throat> they were obedient. We've got to be obedient. In Romans 16 and verse 19, your obedience has come abroad unto all men. Uh, the church of Rome was obedient to the things of the Lord, to the scriptures, and he rejoiced in that obedience. In 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, <clears throat> this is an important obedience. I quoted this first to one of the students at Dallas Theological Seminary. He said, where'd you get that verse? I said, I got it from the Bible. I'm going to read it about every day. Probably he didn't read his Bible. This verse, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought, obedience to Christ. Not simply what we say or where we go, but the thoughts of our hearts must be in obedience to the Lord. That's a tough one, but it's difficult if necessary. Let's read verse number 16 together. I rejoice, therefore, and I have confidence in you in all things. <clears throat> He's rejoicing for confidence. And confidence is a great asset. He had confidence in the Corinthian church because they changed their ways. They repented of what they'd done that was wrong and changed their mind. As far as confidence, in Proverbs 25, 19, there's a caution about confidence here. I quoted to someone on the phone just yesterday, from memory. We say it, let's say it together. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. A broken tooth, you bite on it, it gives way. Foot out of joint, you try to stand, you fall down flat on your face. So we don't have confidence in unfaithful people, especially in time of trouble. You gotta make sure the person is proper, is proper, faithful people. Isaiah 30, verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. You wanted to have confidence in me, but you didn't want. You would not. Israel would not. In quietness and confidence in the Lord should be our strength. And in 2 Corinthians 2, and verse 3. Uh, I wrote the same unto you when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. So he had confidence in the Corinthians, especially in 2 Corinthians. They had trouble in 1 Corinthians. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and verse 22, and we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent, upon the great confidence which I have in you. Again, he said another time, great confidence in the Corinthian church. They mended their ways. We can change our ways. We don't have to be the same sour, pickled people all the rest of our life. We can change our ways. 
all kinds of things. We make mistakes, all of us. And these Corinthians made mistakes, but now they've changed their ways, their attitudes, and the whole thing. Now he has great confidence in them. In Galatians 5 and verse 10, he says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded than what I've been teaching them, but that with he that troubles you shall bear the judgment whosoever he may be. Has confidence that they will obey, not being part of the law of Moses and part of grace, but changing it, confident in them. And so this last part of chapter 7 talks about these eight results of godly sorrow, takes care of other subjects that are very important to us, and to those of us who are genuine Christians, may we follow the Lord in all that we, we find here, and all that we do, and all that we read, and may we have joy and faithfulness and confidence in the Lord. He's the one that never gives up and never changes. It's always perfect. His ways are always the right ways. And we put confidence on people that let us down, unfaithful people in time of need. And those that are unsaved and need Christ as their Savior, pray for them. Those listening, whether in the service here, whether listening by the internet, they may come to our Savior and be saved. Let's close in a word of prayer. We thank thee, our Heavenly Father, for thy words. We thank thee for Paul, faithfulness he gave to these people at Corinth. We're glad for the Corinthians, for though they sinned in the first letter, they changed their ways. Help us to change our ways when we sin, Lord, and to go back to Thee. Thank you that Paul could commend them in truth. Help us to live our lives in truth so people could commend us as well and recommend us because of the things that we stand for. For with us, bless us and use us. Bring us back safely to our afternoon class as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.